Thank you very much. Uh, let me commend uh, the three presenters uh, for the insightful presentation. And listening and also reading the presentation uh, takes me back to the 90s, first year university. Uh, question is growth necessary condition for development? And I realize that we're still going back to uh, development economics. That is the basis uh, that we learned in high school uh, and secondary school. And uh, I think I will take my uh, response from uh, Andy's world, uh, two, two uh, new medals that tries to talk about countries moving from LIC to MIC and putting them into uh, four different groups. And coming from Africa, I think I may want to go a bit back home and then try to uh, dig deep into what those MIC mean to uh, some countries. Of course, uh, growth has been uh, quite strong in uh, all these countries, including those in SSA, and poverty has also been reduced. So it's quite difficult to uh, disagree with the fact that these countries have moved uh, from LIC to MIC, especially when we are using per capita uh, income as the base. However, many of these countries cannot be seen as getting closer to development. I mean, you talk about China, you talk about South Korea, you look at their movement, it's not quite different from what uh, OECD countries are having. But if you go back to SSA, you realize that these countries are MIC, you can call it lower middle income or pseudo MIC. They are still MIC. However, do they have characteristics that can make them uh, qualify to be uh, countries classified as MIC uh, strictly uh, in that sense? Now, you look at some of these countries and they moved from LIC to MIC overnight. And I will give you Nigeria as an example. Nigeria rebased and now is supposed to be the biggest economy in Africa. And you compare Nigeria, the characteristics of the economy, the features of the labor market and so on, you compare to Africa, you see that they are totally different. So we look at Nigeria as the biggest economy but do we consider Nigeria as uh, MIC in a strict sense? Ghana, the same way, 2006 we rebuilt and then we moved to MIC and politicians were jubilating. However, we go deep into the citizens and then you see that we are still where we were uh, 30 years back. So we look at how we measure the MIC uh, to be able to know whether we are talking about development. Now, most of these countries too have also transformed in some sense because the backbone of these countries were agriculture, but now we've moved to service. And somebody can say, well, we've transformed. However, there's also a missing middle and that must also be looked at as we move on. Because I always say the service sector is supposed to support the productive sectors. So if these countries are having a service sector being bigger, than the productive sector, that perhaps these countries are suffering from a disease called elephantiasis, where they have part, maybe the, the lower part of their leg being bigger than the upper part, which is a problem, which needs to be looked at as we uh, try to look at uh, developing these countries and, of course, the SDGs, as Emilia also talked about. Now, most of these countries have also, the growth have also been driven by Minerals. You talk about Zambia, you talk about Ghana, you talk about Nigeria, and these countries have been able to move faster to cross the $1,000 uh, per capita because of oil. Of course, Ghana was supposed to be one of the fastest growing economies in 2011, or 15%, because the oil entered the national account. And you can see that well, per capita uh, income is very high but it has been driven by this. However, manufacturing, which is supposed to create that kind of employment, is not there. Manufacturing continues to go down. And you can talk about Nigeria, you can talk about Zambia, you can talk about all these countries. And we need to interrogate this as well. Indeed, poverty has declined and uh, we don't have any problem uh, to doubt. 
that so, somebody will say, well, it, growth is inclusive. However, we have a number of challenges in these countries that are supposed to be pseudo uh, MIC. Employment is quite vulnerable. Wage employment uh, in manufacturing is going down. We have informality uh, being high. Inequality is something that we are battling with. We're talking about problem with urbanization and housing problem. Many people are having a problem with housing, access to sanitation. We're talking about weak infrastructure as well. So just talking about MIC uh, of these countries, we need to go deeper into it, especially when you graduate from LIC to MIC, you have a challenge of uh, getting aid. And therefore, you have to go to the uh, Eurobond market to be able to get some kind of uh, support. And I was thinking that that is where these countries need some kind of support to be able to improve their infrastructure. In answering Andrew's hypothesis, uh, uh, that does export-led growth determine uh, everything? And from Emily's conclusion of trade as catalyst to long-term development, I would say the answer depends. I would say it depends. Because some countries are doing well. And if I take it from Vladimir's argument that countries have developed, but there are some kind of stress that comes out of mortality through unemployment and so on, then we need to look at it uh, as important issues to interrogate. So uh, I would say that what are the uh, institutional arrangements that will enforce the laws to be able to make these countries also push uh, up a bit? So lessons for development economics. So I have just about three or four uh, questions that I'm posing. So are we saying that we are repackaging the old kind of development theory and calling it inclusive growth? So we have to see whether the, the old thing that we are doing, however, we are calling it uh, inclusive growth these days. What's the role of institutions? What is the role of culture and religion in our discourse? Because many people are stressed out in terms of inequality and poverty, so they resort to religion to be able to get some kind of comfort. So what role does religion and, of course, culture play in this discourse as well? Governance system. Democracy versus uh, authoritarian system. Economic system, too, must also be looked at. Conflict, so control uh, 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 economic system versus market system. And may I pose this question, does location matter? If you're talking about those pseudo kind of MICs, most of them are in SSE. And if these countries are quite far from the developed world, one can say that South Korea, China, they are quite close to Japan. And therefore, that can also be one of the factors that move them quite faster. Then we need to look at location as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, William. Also, congratulations for staying on time. Uh, we have now time uh, for questions. Uh, please indicate uh, your name and which institutions you are, whether you address a question to Amelie, Vladimir, and the, or I think also William, because he made also a number of subsidies important. You may want to sit here uh, uh, behind the table because the PowerPoint is finished, so let's just grab the chair over there and uh, join us uh, at the table. So I look at the room, I see uh, one hand over there, so uh, second, so you have the floor. Uh, yeah. Sorry. <coughs> yeah, uh, my name is Mansoub Morshev. Yes, yeah, for the camera, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, um, but can't, I can't outdo, uh, outdo the performances we had. Uh, my name is Mansoub Morshev from the Institute of Social Studies, part of the Erasmus University of Rotterdam. I have, you know, three uh, sort of mini questions to the three presenters. Uh, the first one is instead of going back to the future, if you we, we went forward to the past. I mean, 50 years ago, many of these um, countries which have acquired middle income status have gone, actually gone back to the past because at the time of, particularly the, the countries in transition are either from sub-Saharan Africa or from Asia. And 50 years ago, the, a lot of these sub-Saharan African countries would have been the counterpart of middle income countries. The, 
trouble is in many cases they declined because of 25 years of uh, low or negative growth. So they'd gone, they'd made a transition. They'd made an earlier downward transition and now they've gone back up. This is not true, I think, for the South Asian countries in the, in the, in the sample. And to Amelia, I just wondered, I always am confused about the uh, least developed country definition, but it seems to me a little bit clearer now that it, it refers to, it sort of overlaps with the low income countries to a, to a certain extent. So how do we, is it per capita income, or, you know, how do we uh, arrive at that? And for Vladimir, could you please just a little bit expand upon the last point you made, which was about the institutional differences between Russia and, Ch and China. And you, your concluding remark was, there's something Latin America about Russian institutions that I was totally confused. I would like you to expand on that. Thank you. Yeah, on the last point, I was in a seminar in Russia just after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and I presented some of the adjustment experiences in Latin America. And my counterparts didn't want to listen to me because he said, you cannot compare Russia to Latin America. We're much better. So why do you come up with all these countries? And I wanted to explain what they could have done better uh, taking into account. So good, good question. Um, you were, yeah, yeah, and then the gentleman there on the Thank you. Board. Yeah, right. Do you and, need me to stand? And the back, yeah. Back part? I don't have to stand. I'm in the front, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah you can. Well, you can stand. Then Ben's always lit on my cameraman. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, my name is Alyssa DiCaprio. I'm from uh, Asian Development Bank. Uh, and my question is actually to everybody, but it comes from a point that Amelia brought up, which is the role of ICT. Um, and so, you know, this is something that we've been thinking about is the role of e-commerce and, and ICT infrastructure for uh, pushing development forward in a sort of non-traditional way, right? Because we've always focused on infrastructure, but what about information infrastructure. Uh, this matters particularly for trade costs in uh, distant countries, small islands, landlocked states. Um, we think it can have a, a huge impact, but I was just wondering what the opinion was with the different panelists. Thank you. I'm Mikko Perkia from the University of Tampere, Finland. I address my question to Professor Popo. Uh, it's a quite a broad one. Uh, going back to late 1980s or early 1990s, so I want to ask, it, it touches about the institutional differences between Russia and China. The why China? I wonder if you can have uh, ad, uh, find some key, key differences between China and Russia. Why China managed to remain its stability and started to reform its governance low, uh, softly? And why Russia ended to the shocking collapse of its state, uh, state capacity? Quite a broad one, but just to touch. Okay, I'm Itaman Natoko from Botswana. Um, my question really relates to the fact that um, uh, a lot of us in Africa are really looking for ideas on how to um, map things going forward. Okay, yeah, well, um, mapping the way forward for Africa is of interest to us and uh, there was, uh, related to trade and aid issues, the playing field has changed with the global crisis. A lot of resources which have, would have gone to development aid are now financing EU and IMF bailouts. Um, on the trade side, we are now in a scenario where um, in the West, agricultural subsidies and non-tariff barriers are going up. So where Africa some years back might have thought that a way forward to have equitable growth would be through promoting agriculture, there are now barriers coming up in that arena. Commodity prices are going down. So it's really um, a challenging phase going forward. So. If there are any ideas, even on how science, technology, innovations could be used to help Africa find new paths, that would be great. Hi, my name is Kristina Karenlahti. I'm from the Central Bank of Finland. And my question is to all of you uh, on an issue that wasn't mentioned today, which is of interest, is the demographic uh, shifts in the global economy and, and their effects, especially for, for Asian countries, European countries, 
development, developed countries and then, then to Africa, if you could please comment on that. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, my name is True Shedvin. I'm from CEDA, the Swedish International Development Cooperation Agency. Um, uh, I just had uh, two questions, one on structural transformation. And uh, I was happy, William, that you brought up the, the service sector and the increasing service sector and, and uh, also linking it to the rest of the economy and the patterns that we're seeing. And I hear during these days that we say that there is no structural transformation but is there no structural transformation? Is it just following another pattern than what it did before and that we need to recognize and that we need to understand better? Uh, that was question number one. And then the other one, um, of course, we are looking at GDP and, and, and we are still categorizing countries according to the size of GDP in low income and, and middle income, etc. But given the size of the informal economies, uh, uh, in in these um, economies and countries, is this still such a relevant uh, uh, measurement? And and how can we capture the informal economy better to understand the actual size of these uh, economies? Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, given time, I close now the uh, questions. We had a number of very relevant and interesting <coughs> questions, questions relating by the decline rather than uh, of some middle-income countries. LDC differentiation, uh, difference between Russia and China in institutions. Uh, two, pers two people asked about technological di differentiation and uh, technological progress. Um, then the uh, question on the global crisis and the trade uh, related to agriculture subsidies, demographic shifts, and then the important question also, what is actually structural transformation about it? Is it a Lewisian thing, uh, activity going from agriculture to manufacturing to services? Or if the economy shifts to services, could we also label that as uh, a structural transformation, given that the nature of services is so wide, mm -hmm. uh, going from very low uh, quality services to very high quality service? And then also a question about the GDP and the informal economy. And I know. William has done a lot of work of that, so I think this question will not flat, fall flat here. Uh, I'm looking at time. Can I ask you uh, to answer the questions very briefly? Two, two and a half minutes uh, maximum. And I think we go in the same order as the presentation. So. Uh, can, can I show a slide? Yes, maybe, because... Uh, uh, I, if, it, yeah. if you have access to it e easily, because otherwise <laughs> we're in a, Otherwise, I ask maybe uh, Andy already to answer the question, and then Popov has time to okay. find his slide. Um, uh, lots of, of good points. I think the, 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 the thing I've the thing I've noticed as as I get older, I seem to read older books, and I don't I don't know. There seems to be a direct relationship between but the more you. My age, you <laughs> <laughs> But it's not just books, it's, 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 it's papers and, and, and you go back into archives and all sorts of things. And actually a lot of the issues we're talking about were, were the, the things exactly that, that Arthur Lewis, uh, um, Dudley Sears especially, and, and uh, um, uh, even Simon Kuznets and others were talking about, you know, just before the 10 or 20 years before WIDA was established. So I think... Um, I mean, in terms of uh, these issues, there's a lot to go go back to. The difference being, for most developing countries, uh, aid is far less important than it was uh, than it than it was 30 years ago. Uh, the countries are at much higher levels of income, which is not a good measure of development. But it does it is a proxy for it's some kind of proxy for uh, more domestic resources being available. I think in terms of, I mean, just to respond to some of the points, on the, on the, the issues of uh, the bounce backs, I think you're, you're entirely right. I mean, a, a lot of countries don't, you know, growth periods go in spurts. Countries grow, through, grow for a bit and then something happens and grow for another bit. And we, we know relatively little about, you know, why, why that is even. Um, we certainly can identify after the event things that have happened, but we can also look at countries that weren't expected to grow and then suddenly grew. So... I mean, it, you're entirely right in one sense that it's not sort of linear, but hopefully, for, for certainly for the big and populous countries, it seems to have been sort of uh, an upward, uh, upward turn. Um, I think there's, um, I mean, on the ICTs, I think there's an interesting point here that 
even for the better off developing countries, commercial lending rates on 10-year treasury bonds are still around 10%, whereas the EU or you know, World Bank can borrow at whatever, 0.2% or something. There's a very interesting argument for long-run commercial lending, I think. Uh, I mean, you're talking about infrastructure and, uh, and ICTs, and it may be quite difficult for even better off developing countries to find the fiscal space when they have a multitude of demands to, to put money into things that may not seem so urgent, but actually in, in today or even in five years' time could be very urgent. So I think that the case for, for more long-run infrastructure type uh, lending is, is very significant. On the different kinds of structural transformation, again, you know, going back to Sears and the limitations of the special case, there's all sorts of uh, uh, ways we could look at this. I mean, it really comes down to almost, uh, right, I mean, as Sears said elsewhere, not looking at, at one indicator like, like uh, GDP per capita, but looking at a range of indicators, what's happening to poverty, unemployment, although, you know, some of those figures are, uh, um, uh, can be contentious. And I think, if anything, something like the, the, the proportion of the labour force in agriculture gives you a pretty good sense of what, what the country, is, is, the level of development, uh, or, or the tax revenues over GDP gives you a sense of the strength of the state. So it might, it might depend, uh, the kind of indicator you want to look at might depend on what you're looking for. Uh, if you're trying to say something about governance, then I'd probably look at, at tax data uh, because of the relationship between the, ta the type of tax base a country has. Um, I think Lewis, uh, sorry, I think Dudley Sears made, you know, in the limitations of special case, there's a whole, there's 15 or 20 things that he suggested around structural change, which obviously, you know, same time that Arthur Lewis was writing. Um, and then I think my, the only other point I'd probably make is... Um, About, uh, uh, about the world's poorest countries, there are surprising amounts of raw resources locked up in fossil fuel subsidies. And when I looked, I've got, did the data in a new book, I actually found that even at $2.50, if you reallocated the resources that are currently locked in fossil fuel subsidies into, into poverty transfers, cash transfers to the poor, you'd actually cover three quarters of the world's poor. Now, obviously, for developing countries, the reallocation of a be subsidy benefit that benefits car drivers and the urban elites towards the rural poor is, 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 is really tough. So it, there's an interesting argument there about how you help governments reallocate resources. We, we included in the calculation actually a, a complete compensation for the poor because the poor benefit from kerosene subsidies. So we actually, it's largely based on petroleum. Take a country like Sudan. 80% of Sudan's poverty, 80% of Sudan's poverty at $2.50 is technically coverable in Sudan's fossil fuel subsidies. And that probably brings you back to issues around governance and democracy. Thank okay, you. Okay, thank you for cutting you short, but there are other people. That's okay. Later in the day. Vladimir, your slide is up, so. Thank you so much. Yes, I put the slide on the screen because I'm afraid I won't be able to make all the arguments, so maybe it will be helpful to follow. Now, answering uh, Mansroub's question, uh, the reason, if you take developing countries today, there are two groups of developing countries looking at indicators of the state institutional capacity, such as murder rate, uh, shadow economy, and you know, there are indices of institutional capacity by the World Bank, there are six of them, I can go deeper into it, but basically they show you the same picture. The picture is this one. There is Latin America, sub saharan Africa, and former Soviet Union, at least part of the former Soviet Union, Ukraine, Russia, Baltic states, Kazakhstan. There you have murder rates of 10, 20, 30 per 100,000 of inhabitants, like in Latin America, like in Sub-Saharan Africa. You take South Asia, South e uh, East Asia, South Asia, and MENA countries, Middle East and North Africa, one, two, three. It's not, you know, 10% difference, it's times, order, the order of magnitude. One, two, three murders per 100,000 of inhabitants, right? Why it is the case? The institutional roots are different. Since the 16th century, the 16th century, the West starts to get rich, uh, gets out of the Malthusian trap. Developing countries imitate, some of them, imitate the development of the West. Latin America, Russia, westernization. Either conscious westernization or because of colonialism, forced colonization, right? When they imitate the exit from the Malthusian trap, the inequality increases, right? They get all the results of the enclosure policy with the vagabonds and the, you know, poverty and mass uh, uh, de uh, deprivation of the masses, but the savings rate rises, 
and they start to develop faster. Latin America develops, MENA and East Asia and South Asia are at the same level. $500 per capita, right? They stay at this level until 1950, right? Now, in 1950, there are small changes in productivity going on, uh, and savings rate gradually increases. Once they start to increase, they have low inequality. And with low inequality, they don't undermine institutions. They retain collectivist institutions, which prohibit the increase, high increase in inequality. So the institutions, judging by the indicators like murder rate and shadow economy, remain uh, pretty strong. And they have the advantage. And that's why they take off. They were behind Latin America and behind Russia, but now they take off and get clear. So this is a general scheme, yes, that why you compare Russia with Latin America? Well, what else? It's, it's very close comparison, very close. Yes, I think Latin America and Russia are very close together. The GDP per capita is the same. High income inequalities, if you look at Russia before revolution and today after the revolution, the inequalities are pretty much comparable. Russia has a Gini of over 40, and it doesn't take into account all the quality because if you look at the billionaires, there is a chart on the billionaires. Can I show you? Yes. No, 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 and if I can briefly answer the question from the gentleman from the University of Helsinki, three reasons, I would say, China and Russia. The first one is that centrally planned economy works worse than the market economy, but it works for 25 years. Why for 25 years? I'll explain it in a moment if I'll have time. No, the second have reason, time. I don't explain it. I don't okay. explain it. I go to the second reason. Okay, I do it. This is here because you told me. I think. The second reason is that uh, it was a choice of policy. Gorbachev tried to do gradual reforms. He had. So China started transition after 25 years of centrally planned economy. Russia started transition. Russia should have started transition in 1960 during Khrushchev. And if Russia would make this transition, the highest point of Russian GDP to Western GDP was 1965. Since Russia was catching up, catching up, the first country that was catching up together with Japan. Then there were other countries, but first it was Russia, right? Uh, and after that, it stopped catching up. It started to get behind. Maybe you could the second discuss reason, over coffee uh, yeah. the, the, the okay. answer because there are two more people. The second and reason the next is session. just name it. Two just reasons. name it in yeah. five seconds. Yeah, right. The second reason was the pace of transition. Gradualism is better. And the third reason, ability to retain the strong state institutions. Okay, thank okay. you. Amelia? Uh, I'll get the mic. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's a good question, Mansu, because we get it all the time. It's not, a, it's not evident how LDC's criteria is determined. Basically, it's a mix of three criteria. One is the income, it's gross national income. So the, the number for inclusion is $1,035. The same the, as the line. Yeah. Exactly. No. Exactly. So it's, it overlaps with the, it's basically the, law, the, the income criteria. Then comes the human access, asset uh, criteria and the economic vulnerability index. So the Committee for Development Policy of the Economic and Social Council of the UN is informed based on this composite index mixing these three categories. What happens in the long, medium term is that some countries achieved uh, they, for example, the threshold to, to exit the category, you have Angola. Angola didn't want to graduate from the LDC category, but we are talking about uh, $5,000 per capita income. But based on, others, uh, on other issues, they claim that they were not ready to graduate. But there are, there are thresholds to graduate from the category, and it's a political process because you have to ensure a smooth transition out of the category into middle income status. So it's a composite index, but having said that, it's very heterogeneous. And in, when you think about policy formulation, it's very difficult to put all these countries, the all producers, in one box with the Bangladesh exporting textile and with the small islands. Uh, we have no base for diversity diversification. Uh, you have pop, uh, countries like Kiribati with 1,000 people population. So to design a policy mix for these countries is very challenging. And that takes me to the point of, of Alisa about ICT. You have 
not only small islands that are LDCs, but we have landlocked countries that are LDCs. And at the same time, they are transit countries for other developing countries and lead developed countries. So when you think about infrastructure, you cannot think about only the bridge, the roads, and the traditional uh, development banks type of infrastructure, but the role that the new, the new technologies and ICT can bring about to these countries, especially in, in services. And finally, about trade finance, there is a lot of discussion about this aid for trade, whether it's repackaging or not, is a repackaging of official development assistance with a new name managed in Geneva. And it's based in the intersection between the trade regime and the, because it's hosted at the WTO under the development agenda. So I think that has to be challenged and also the way, and again, Alice is here citing an article that she just published, the way that trade economists think about trade finance in a traditional way linked only with, with ODA. But also we have to think about other commercial sources of how to fund exports in these developed countries and develop countries in general. Thank you very much, Emilia. Okay, so I give you Brilliant. the floor. Well, to point to transformation and yes, thank you. Uh, well, I think the question about whether a move from agriculture to service is transformation. You can define transformation the way you want, but what do you want to achieve? If we are talking about transformation, that will improve livelihood of the people. Then you have to know where the livelihood improvement will come from. So if you look at most of these countries where service is now the leading, Service, which area of service are we talking about? We're talking about telecommunication, we are talking about trade, which just create employment for the external countries, and we are talking about finance. And what kind of financial services are we talking about? Giving some kind of credit to trade and so on. So if you do this and then you neglect the productive sectors, which is manufacturing and agriculture, which is supposed to create employment for majority of the people to be able to improve their livelihood, then your transformation will not benefit the people. So that for me, my understanding is that to be able to, for, for transformation to benefit the people, it must move into areas that will give them sustainable kind of income. And that is why moving from agriculture to manufacturing before you move to service is the way to go. And of course, classifying economies by per capita income. I intend to agree with people who conclude that we cannot just use the per capita income as a way of telling countries that they are MIC or LIC. For instance, you come to Africa, economic activity, the underground economic activity, which we may call the informal, is quite strong. Many people engage in economic activity which don't actually come to the market. For instance, we have a farmer who goes to the who goes to the farm and gets everything and just consume so it will not be captured so in that instant you may underestimate the gdp apart from that you also look at gdp coming from other areas in ghana we have the oil that pushed gdp but the benefit to the country was just about three or five percent and are you saying that we are mic and therefore it is going to benefit the people so that is something that we need to look at how do we measure these indicators even if you talk about joblessness and unemployment, you go to these countries, unemployment sometimes about 5%. It is because of the way the concept is generated. And I think it is important that we look at some of these indicators and contextualize it within the countries. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank all the speakers, public. We stayed more or less on time, so <laughs> thank you very much. And